Well, thank you, Matt. Thank you, Evelyn. Uh, and I th th thanks also to Doug Jeffrey, who I'm told may be here. He's the, uh, the chap who <coughs> invited me. Uh, it's great to be back at Hillsdale, and um, I'm delighted to be here. And I'm especially delighted to have this opportunity to talk to you about Plutarch. Plutarch. He's one of my favorite, well, I was going to say ancient authors, but in fact, he's one of my favorite authors, period, ancient or modern. He has a lot to tell us, not only about our topic, the art of biography, but also about the ultimate subject of biography, which Matt alluded to, which is to say, life itself and how it ought to be lived. Of course, like all ancient authors today, Plutarch is at best, at best, a name to most people, even, or perhaps especially, to most college-educated people, outside the precincts of, of Hillsdale College, anyway. <clears throat> now, all of you, all of you here are a select group because you know that Plutarch was a Greek biographer and moral philosopher who wrote, among many other things, a famous series of parallel lives comparing various Greek and Roman figures. Perhaps, like me, you first learned about Plutarch from reading the notes to some of Shakespeare's plays, Julius Caesar, Antony and Cleopatra, Timon of Athens, and Coriolanus, the four plays for whose plots Shakespeare drew heavily upon Plutarch, who had only recently been translated into English. Perhaps you also, like me, dipped casually into the odd volume of Plutarch now and again, to find out more about Cato, or Pericles, or Cicero, or Alexander the Great, or some other antique worthy. You have probably also noticed that whenever you look into the literature about ancient Greece or Rome, the phrase Plutarch says occurs over and over again. Plutarch says this about Lycurgus. Plutarch says that about Sulla. He says a third thing about Solon or Publius Publicola. The man is ubiquitous. There are, of course, many other sources besides Plutarch, but none, I think, are more wide-ranging, well-informed, and entertaining. But how about Plutarch the man, who was he? We know some things, but as with many figures from the ancient world, there is a lot we don't know. If you look up Plutarch, you will likely come across a picture of this bust, which is perched in a prominent place in his native village of Chironia in central Greece. Unfortunately, you will also discover that it is only tentatively identified as Plutarch. Maybe he looked like this, but maybe he looked more like this chap in a Renaissance medallion, and I apologize for the, the fuzzy reproduction, who is also offered to the world as Plutarch. We really don't know. We do know that his name was a good example of the common Greek habit of aspirational naming. Plutarch. The playwright Agathon, who features in Plato's Symposium, gloried in a name that meant the good. Agathon, that's pretty aspirational. Plutarch, who came from a wealthy family that was prominent in civic affairs, and I hope you can all read that, gloried in a name that meant rich or wealthy ruler or leader. So he was a wealthy leader. That's what the, what the name means. Later, when he became a Roman citizen, he may, we don't really know, he may have added the given names of one of his likely sponsors, a chap called Lucius Mestrius Florus. 
And what about Chironia, Plutarch's native village? Students of ancient history, and I can, I'll point out where that is if I can do this correctly. So Chironia is right there where the little red star is. And it has a red star, by the way, because there was a famous battle there in 338 BC when Philip II, probably accompanied by his son Alexander, the not yet great, defeated the armies of Thebes and Athens and established the uh, hegemony of Macedon over Greece. Plutarch spent the majority of his time in Chironia, shuttling between there and Delphi, about 30 miles. Oops, I've got to go back, sorry. Delphi is right there, you see. So it's just 30 miles there to the west. And you see Athens is down there. We've got all of the uh, famous vacation spots on this slide. <clears throat> uh, he spent the majority of his time in Chironia, going back and forth between uh, Delphi, where he was involved in the famous Delphic Ordal. Oracle as priest of Apollo. As a young man, he studied philosophy and history and science and mathematics in Athens. By the time of Plutarch, which is to say the second half of the first century AD and well into the first quarter of the second century, Greece had fallen from its former prosperous and independent situation. The Romans had put Greece firmly under their thumb when they sacked Corinth in 146 BC, the same year that they sacked Carthage, thus ending the Third Punic War. Rome was very busy around that time. Plutarch's ancestors, in fact, saw the local populace conscripted by Mark Antony to supply his troops with grain during the war with Octavian, the future Augustus, in the 30s BC. The memory of that imposition continued to rankle down to Plutarch's own time. But if Greece had fallen in its fortunes, Rome was riding high. Plutarch, born in the reign of Claudius, flourished from the reign of Vespasian to the beginning of the reign of Hadrian. Gibbon, Gibbon thought that time the time from the Emperor Nerva through Marcus Aurelius, the time of the five good emperors, was the happiest time in all recorded history to be alive. If you ask for a map of the Roman Empire, usually you'll be given a map from 117, like this map, the end of Trajan's reign, when the empire was at its greatest extent. So this was Plutarch's time. He came into his own as an author during the reigns of uh, Trajan and Hadrian. And you can see by a glance at some, the dates of some of his contemporaries that it was a period of great cultural as well as political accomplishment. Seneca, Suetonius, Pliny the Younger, Juvenal, Tacitus, and others. There was an impressive panoply of talent circulating and what we call Rome's Silver Age. Uh, I was amused to see in some of the advertisements for this conference, and uh, Matt actually alluded to it in his introduction, an invocation of the Bloomsbury biographer Lytton Strachey. At first blush, you might think that there was a link between what Plutarch and Strachey were attempting to do with their biographies. Plutarch wrote about the most illustrious men of the past, and Strachey wrote about eminent Victorians. But in fact, one would have to search far and wide to discover a figure more antithetical to the spirit of Plutarch than Lytton Strachey. Plutarch's goal was emulation. He wrote about famous men of the past primarily to disclose their virtues in order that we might aspire to embody those virtues. If he also analyzed their vices, it was as a warning. This way lie unhappiness and ruin. Above all, Plutarch was entirely in earnest. Strachey, on the contrary, 
put the whole world in sneering quotation marks. Irony was his calling card. He had nothing but contempt for the four eminences he wrote about. Cardinal Manning, General Charles Gordon, Thomas Arnold, and Florence Nightingale. Strachey sought to lay bare what he called the, quote, psychological problems suggested by their inner history. About Manning and the Oxford movement, for example, he poked fun at, quote, the strange notion of taking Christianity literally, really to mean every word you said when you recited the Athanasian Creed? How wonderful. Strachey was there in General Gordon's tent to mock when the great general retired, sunk in despondency with his Bible and a bottle of brandy. That's a picture of Gordon there in the cover of eminent Victorians, just about to meet his end in Khartoum at the hands of the Mahdi's assassins. Strachey does not mention the interesting fact that Gordon recommended Plutarch's lives to his officers. The great general knew that it would do them good to witness so much unashamed masculine virtue being praised. Strachey could hardly believe that Thomas Arnold, the renowned headmaster of the rugby school and father of Matthew Arnold, could actually seriously aspire to produce Christian gentlemen. And Florence Nightingale, who lived so selflessly for others, he regarded as, quote, a terrible woman, whose decline into impotent senility he recorded with appalling relish. Strachey's rich mixture of irony and contempt do characterize an important current of modern cultural endeavor, but such qualities were utterly foreign to Plutarch. Now, literary fashion is a mysterious thing. Why is it that Sir Walter Scott, for example, whom generations of readers found absolutely spellbinding, is largely unread and, for many of us, unreadable today. Why is it that the Renaissance Italian poet Tasso, who fired imaginations from Milton and Dryden to Shelley, Byron, and Goethe, should now subsist as a decoration in scholarly footnotes instead of as a living presence? Why is it that Plutarch, for centuries Europe's schoolmaster, as the classicist C.J. Giancaris put it in his book about Plutarch, why is it that he should quite suddenly move from center stage to the mental off-off Broadway of reference books and dissertations? If Plutarch, as the diplomat and scholar Sir Paul Harvey put it, is, quote, one of the most attractive of ancient authors, writing with charm, geniality, and tact, so as always to interest the reader, why does he no longer interest us? Doubtless there are many reasons, competing attractions, educational atrophy, cultural amnesia, the demotic temper of the age. It seems clear at any rate that wholesale changes of taste are never merely matters of taste, they express a larger metamorphosis, new eyes, new ears, a new scale of values and literary philosophical assumptions. It is part of the baffling cruelty of fashion to render mute what only yesterday spoke with such extraordinary force and persuasiveness. It is one of the major tasks of criticism, I think, to reanimate those voices, to provide that peculiar medium through which they might seem to speak in the way that their best, their most ardent, ardent hearers understood them. Plutarch's best hearers form a distinguished but exceedingly various group. He made a deep impression upon some early Christian writers which helps explain why so much of his work survived the conflagrations of late antiquity. A Byzantine monk who has a great name, Maximus Planutus, copied the entire corpus that, has come down, that came down to him in the late 13th and early 14th centuries. Erasmus 
resonating to Plutarch's urbane humanism, translated and broadcast his work. In the 16th century, Henry IV of France wrote to his wife that, quote, Plutarch always delights me with a fresh novelty. To love him is to love me, for he has long been the instructor of my youth. Shakespeare, Sidney, Ben Jonson, Dryden, Milton, and Bacon learned and freely borrowed from him, as did Shaftesbury, Winkelmann, Lessing, Hume, and Addison. Plutarch, Addison wrote, has more strokes of good nature in his writing than I can remember in any author. <laughs> 